All right, so this week, um, several times, I've had at least four people talk to me about, before we even get into the message, why, why should we even believe the Bible? And some of you that have internet, you might have come across a guy named Bodie Beck, right? Guy's fantastic. But he succinctly answers this question. And I think, maybe not so much for the folks here, maybe if you're new to studying the Bible, you might want to have a couple of reasons why we believe the Bible is worth studying, or should we even believe what it says? So he, he goes on, and he's got a bulleted list, and he says, because the Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents. And I was talking earlier today with someone, and, and, and I don't know if we realize this, but once we become believers, we are now the people of God, and we are heirs to the covenants of promise, and what this Bible teaches is our history now, too. We need to remember that it's important, and history is not only just written by the people who won the battles, per se, but it's written, um, written down by eyewitnesses, right? That's the second thing Bodhi lists. He says, because the Bible was written down by eyewitnesses, okay? So one of the issues that we've got in, in culture today is this belief in science. Science answers all, it knows all, and what science or archaeology doesn't find in the dirt, then it must not have happened. But we have eyewitness testimony going back all the way that, that, that gives us good, reasonable belief that these things happened. People saw it. And when they testified of these things, there were people alive during the time of Christ or whatever prophet, and they could have, there, there's nothing else in, 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 in antiquity written like our Bible. So, because it was written down during the lifetimes of other eyewitnesses, and it, wasn't, it has not been refuted. I mean, there are always going to be people who don't believe and who want to uh, sow seeds of discord and doubt. The simple fact of the matter is, is that our scripture is pretty solid. We've got great evidence. Nothing in antiquity even comes close to it. Stuff that was written about Alexander the Great 700 some years after his death. Nobody knew this man. But our stuff from the first century, we've got over almost 7,000 manuscripts today. And we're finding them all over the place. But there's good attestation for our scriptures. Good reason to believe. We have eyewitnesses. And it says, um, these people, these eyewitnesses, they proclaimed that their writings were divine. Now, in, 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 um, in Paul's writing, 2 Timothy, if you'd uh, open your Bibles with me, 2 Timothy 3.16. I'm going to read two scriptures today. One of them is from Timothy, and one was from 2 Peter. So if you want to put a thumb there. childhood, you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And then he says, Paul says his famous line, all scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for, for rebuke, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the man of God or the woman of God um, may be fully capable and equipped for every good work. This is the updated NASB, and it actually put that man or woman, so that's kind of interesting. It's good. I know that the 1995 doesn't do that. And then um, the second passage of Scripture, it kind of speaks to the fact that we have eyewitness testimony. You have 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in um, verse 16 through 21. It says, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his testimony, for when we received honor and glory from God the Father, such as an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven, 
when we were with him on the holy mountain, so we have a prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in the dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit uh, spoke from God. We have a sure word. When, when we read these scriptures and we try to find hope in them, we try to find instruction and correction in our lives, when we try to walk out our faith with fear and trembling, we can be sure that this word is true and that there's nothing else like it on the planet. We can be sure. So when somebody asks you for the hope that you have in your heart and you're ready to give them an answer, break out your Bible and use it. It's... it's is a true word of God, you can trust it. A lot of people have trouble trusting it. They, they, they sometimes wonder, how is it that we can place so much faith in it? Well, our eyewitness testimony tells us today, and it has been screaming it from the rooftops, that this is the Anastas. This is God breathed. This is for our lives each day. And if we wake up one day without reading our Bibles, then we're doing this wrong. We're walking in our faith, wrong. We should be digging into the Word of God because it is the only thing that separates us from the world that we live in. It's the only thing that brings hope. I'm getting caught up, sorry. <laughs> I knew I was going to do that. You know, I, in seminary, we, we, do, we do a lot of reading and a lot of people that I admire in seminary, great minds. They, they, they tend to get through the scriptures every 90 days. They read through the entire Bible every 90 days. So that's, that's, that's a lot of reading. Um, you know, 20 to 30 uh, chapters a day, religiously, if you will. And so when you start to do that, it starts to become a part of your life. It becomes that, that thing that gives you hope each day when you wake up. And you know what? I've been studying for almost a decade now. And I find out new things every time I open the Bible and read it. It's like, this is amazing. I didn't see this before. Maybe it's just in plain English. Maybe it's something it's, I studied in the original languages. But every time I read the Bible, I find something different to focus on, to teach on, to, to bring hope to my life, to share with people I meet on the street. It's the only book that can do that. I don't know of any other writing that can guide up and direct our lives so perfectly. So... I, I, if I would say one thing, if I could end it right here, right now, read your Bibles every day and get as much of it as you can. There are many Bible apps out there that will read it for you. So there's no excuse that we just don't have time. We, you know, we don't have a Bible. If you've got a smartphone, you can you can download these apps for free. If if you want to figure out which one I'm using, come see me later. I'll I'll show you what it is. And I've got my entire fa my entire family's doing this with me. It's so wonderful. And when your kids come to you and start asking you questions about God, the Bible, and, well, I read this today, Dad, what did it mean? Now I get to start acting like the priest in my home that God called me to be so that I can preach hope into my children's life, and they will preach it into their children's lives. And the next thing you know, we're going to have an entire generation of people who love God and love His Word. And so today when we're studying the Psalms, that's what I hope to convey, a, a, an absolute love for God's Word and how David absolutely loved God's Word. It informed every aspect of his life. There is nothing that David did, whether it was good or bad, that he did not consult the Lord after having done it or before having done it. Okay, so let me... So let's get on with the message. All right. So today's today's message it, it comes from Psalm 138, and um, in the in the book of Psalms there are a lot of different types of literature. Um, Psalm 138. Let me just get there. Sully, could you go? All right. Fine. That's fine right there. All right. So I do have a couple 
introductory things with the book of Psalms because in these next couple of weeks we're going to be focusing on the book of Psalms and Michael is going to do a couple, uh, he's going to do a message on a couple of the Psalms coming up. So I thought it would be a good idea to talk about what the book of Psalms is. Um, it comes from the Greek word um, uh, psalm, psalmoi, which uh, just means a song. Um, the Hebrew word is telakim. And that is an interesting word because it, it is a book of songs of praise. Songs of praise. Um, the, the book of Psalms, I, I don't know if anybody has studied the, the Hebrew Tanakh um, in depth and know that it's, it's, it's put together a lot differently than our, than our, our, our Bibles, our most King James or uh, NASB. It's put together. The, the order of the books are different. Um, the, the sections are different. Um, they're the same books that we have in ours, but they're a little bit different. And then in the section of the Tanakh that the, the, the Book of Psalms comes from is from the Ketuvim, which, which are the writings. And, and just to give you a little perspective on how informative this, this book is um, in the lives of believers and for Israel in general, it was, it was, their, it was their handbook and it, it was the Christian handbook in the early church. So Christ says this about the book of Psalms, um, the, well, the Tanakh and the prophets. He says in, in Luke 24, in verse 44, now, on the road to Emmaus, we had some disciples coming home, and they were downtrodden. Our Lord had been crucified. They hadn't fully recognized that there was a resurrection, and they were moping. And all of a sudden, the Lord of glory shows up walking next to these guys on the road. And they didn't recognize him at first. Some of the things that came out of his mouth, then they started to recognize him. And then it says this. It says, Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So, says a lot of things. So he opened up their minds to the Tanakh, the body of scriptures that they used, the early church. They didn't have a fully formed New Testament. They had the Tanakh. And that's what they used to preach the gospel. So I think that's interesting. I think we should be preaching the gospel from, from the entire Bible, not just parts of it. But it's interesting to know that we can preach the gospel from the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. <clears throat> and it also is like, it, it gives us some kind of a, a, an idea of the parameters of it. The books of Moses, the Psalms, and the prophets. So there's no other extra biblical writings in there, apocryphal. Because some of our older Bibles, um, they contain the apocrypha. And there were more historical books to inform us of things historically. And they weren't theanostas and given to us to be authoritative like, like our scriptures are. So I think that's important to know that it kind of bookmarks that because, you know, we get these Gnostic Gospels and every once in a while somebody, somebody brings that up and then they want to say, well, we've got hidden knowledge. We have got the sure word of God. Um, and as I was saying, the, the, the book of Psalms, it's, it's a hymn book of Israel and of early Christians. Um, and like I was talking about a little bit earlier, the, the, the the scriptures in general help us walk in our sanctification. They're not what um, saves us, if you will. They're given to a saved people. Israel was called out of Egypt. They were saved by the mighty hand of God. They were brought to the mountain, not by themselves, because as Michael says, and I'm, I'm so in agreement with him, and in Exodus 12, we see that the mixed multitude, they came out of, out of Egypt with the people of God, and they were at that mountain with the people of God, and they heard the thunders and the, and the lightnings, and they heard the word of God spoken to them, and it changed them. The nations around them, they all heard it, and they trembled because Israel was, was walking in what God had promised Father Abraham long ago. Abraham died before even having been given the land, but he believed in God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And so when the people of God went into the land of Israel, there was something about that prophetic time in life where the nations around him, they all trembled. 
we're going to talk a little bit about that because uh, David, he, in, in this song that we're getting ready to, to, to go through, he talks about the kings of the nations. And, and in the psalm that I read this morning, in Psalm 2, um, it talks about how the nations and the kings are all against the Lord and against his, his people and against his son even. I mean, it's amazing. The second psalm speaks of the son. I mean, I mean there, there, are, there are folks out there that they, they don't believe in the, inter, the eternal son of God. They think he's a, a created being. They think he's an angel. Some people think he's a fraud. You know, our Jewish brethren who don't yet believe in Christ. But our, our faith, we're Judeo-Christian. Our faith comes from that understanding. Yes, Jesus is the realization of the promise to Abraham. The promise in the garden of, of, of the seed that would crush the head of the serpent to, to destroy sin once and for all. Jesus is the realization of that. And, and, and throughout all of the scriptures, through the Psalms, we, you can walk through these Psalms, and just like it said in, in Luke 24, 44, it, it, it speaks of Messiah, His coming, and, and what people before us believed about the Messiah, and is there a Messiah? There is. I mean, they all knew it. Okay, so Paul, he, he, he writes in, in, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, chapter 5, verse 19, he says, speak, he says, speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. I just, I just have to ask. I mean, the last few weeks, I've just been waking up early in the morning, and the first thing I say out of my mouth, because I've been trying to, to, to set the trajectory of my day with a, a, a morning praise and worship of my God and Creator. He woke me up in the morning. I'm able to get up out of bed and get dressed and get ready for work. And, and before I even touch the floor, I want to say, Blessed are you, Lord God, for waking me up, for giving me breath, for giving me a beautiful family so that I can get up and I have, I have a hope in my heart from the moment I get out of my bed. And that's what the Word of God has done for me. That's why I recommend everyone start their day reading the Scriptures. If it's just a chapter a day or two, first thing in the morning, you'll get through the entire Bible in a year. Be consistent. We are more consistent with a TV show that we like to watch than we are with reading the Word of God, and it shouldn't be that way. We have gotten so used to watching TikTok or whatever it is on your smartphones that we, we don't spend time with the Word of God anymore. And then we wonder why when things happen in our lives and we don't have, we don't have any understanding of why, how does this happen? Should we have hope? Well, David in the Psalms, and I'm about ready to <laughs> preach it again. Um, David lived a life of, of joy, of blessing, but he also had many trials and tribulations, just like we all do. I mean, my family's health has not been good. Praise God, I've been getting better. My wife, it seems like every time she walks out of the house, she's injured. It's, it's, it's crushing. But if I did not have the hope that's contained in this word, I would fold up and I, would, I, just, I just wouldn't be here anymore. So God gives me hope to live. He's the one that gave me breath in the first place. So give all glory to God. When you wake up in the morning, make the first thing that you say out of your mouth as, as a blessing to the Lord and thanking Him for, for the breath that you have in your lungs that morning. If you start your day off with praise and worship of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, your life, no matter how hard it gets, it's going to be better because He is your hope. So the book of Psalms, Mr. Preachy here. Okay, so the book is filled with 150 of the Psalms. Um, interestingly, the breakdown, the breakdown is 73 of them were written by David um, or ascribed to him. 49 of them were anonymous. 12 of them were writ written by Asaph. Uh, 12 of them by the sons of Korah. Two of them by Solomon. And one by Moses. And one by Ethan. So, when you, when you look at a book and you're getting ready to exegete, in other words, interpret what, what the English is meaning to you, sometimes what you want it, well, every time you do that, 
when you look at a book in the Bible, you, you want to ask yourself who wrote it. Who was he talking to? What were the people that he was talking to? What are they, what are they trying to get out of this? Why, why is he even making a, an effort to write it down or to speak this? And so that makes it easier for you to understand what you're reading. But with the book of Psalms, it's a little bit more complicated. It was written over a large period of time. And it was written by many different authors and about many different topics and subjects and, and things of that matter. And, and, and so when you, when you look at that, you have to do a little more digging. And for anyone who doesn't study the Greek or the Hebrew or have these lexicons, maybe, maybe you have more than one Bible in the house from different translations. It's a really good idea to do that, to have and read it from different perspectives. Because everybody who sits on a committee writing most of our Bibles, they've had years of training and they, have, they know how to interpret these words and, and these idioms that are spoken in these languages. So read it from different versions and try to get an understanding of it. And so when you come at the book of Psalms, and I've listened to a lot of commentary this last couple of weeks as I was preparing it, and there are some pastors that say that they didn't really learn how to preach until they started preaching through the Psalms. And so that gave me hope. So maybe I'll get to do this more often <laughs> and preach through the Psalms. Okay, so Psalm 138 comes after Psalm 37, right? Okay. All right, so as I was reading through the commentaries, um, we know that this book was, I just, I just covered that, but the book was written over a long period of time. And so there were people who came together and they organized these passages and they put them in an order. How many books do we have in our Torah? Five, right? Okay. The book of Psalms was patterned after the Torah. It has five books. There are five books of Psalms. And like I said, multiple authors over large periods of time. Uh, from start to finish though, the opening Psalms are like, like Psalm 1. It's, it sets the trajectory of the entire book, five books. Blessed is the person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Right? And so our meditation on the word of God, whether you, you're studying from the apostolic scriptures or the Tanakh, God's word is a joy. You should be, it says happy, or oh how blessed in the Hebrew, it's an exclamation of blessedness. Oh how blessed is the person who does what? Who walks in the counsel, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the path of sinners, but his delight is in the word of God, the law of God. And I would argue every utterance of, of God is authoritative and therefore, and therefore could be taken as a law that we live by, right? I mean, uh, it's not a matter of should we do these things, it's how we do these things. Why we do these things. Uh, uh, Pastor Michael has always said, and, and especially going through the book of Romans, he's very positive of, about the law of God and how it informs our lives and how it helps us walk in sanctification. It's not the means of justification. It could never be. It was never meant to be our justification. It is how one lives after finding salvation in the creator of the world. He gave us instructions. It, 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 it's, uh, uh, in Ephesians 2 and 15, you know, we're saved by grace through faith, not of works. But what does it say in, in verse 10? That God prepared good works for us in advance to walk in them. And so when we walk in these ways of God, when we're reading through the Psalms and the Torah and then in the New Testament and we see things that inform our lives, it should bring joy to us to walk in the ways of God. We shouldn't be ashamed of, of walking in a precept that the scriptures clearly say that we should walk in. Why should we, why should we be ashamed? When I, I mentioned the passage of scripture um, from Paul in Ephesians 5. And, 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 and the whole passage is about imi being imitators of Christ. Paul was an imitator of Christ. We are to imitate Paul as he imitated Christ. We are to walk in a manner that is pleasing to God. When our lives, uh, 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 
when our lives conform to the word of God, it becomes a, a sweet savoring, like an offering that goes up before the God of creation and he's pleased with our lives. We are saved by grace through faith, but if we think that we can walk any old way in our lives, I think we're wrong for doing so. And anybody reading this book that comes away with that information, they're reading it wrong. We don't have a liberty to transgress God's commandments, but we have the uh, uh, obligation of understanding which ones those are, that mean that which ones that pertain to us, right? Okay, I'm preaching again. But um, so Psalm 137 is an imprecatory psalm. Anybody know what that imprecate? So from the word imprecate, it's a curse. An imprecatory psalm is a curse. And so, uh, Psalms 137, it, it, it talks about not, not speaking in, in the presence of, of the nations or the heathens. And, and, and 138 it is a declaration that even the kings and the nations will praise our God. And so, in Psalm 137, the people have been taken away in, into captivity. Right? They're suffering, and their captors are saying, well, sing us a song from Zion. And the end result of, of that is this imprecatory psalm, and it's, it's kind of harsh. It says, blessed will be the one who seizes and dashes your children against the rocks. That's harsh, isn't it? But that's probably what was happening to the people of Israel as Babylon was taking them into captivity. And that is definitely what happened when uh, Pharaoh decided that Israel was becoming too strong of a nation, kill all of the babies, feed them to the alligators or the crocodiles, and, 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 and it's what happens. And so the people of God, heartbroken, Psalm 137 is imprecatory. And it's hard to read those things, but we should know about them and we should understand why why they were writing those things. Because those things too are imprecatory. Or, well, I'm sorry, theonostas. Those things too are God breathed. So in the end, when God returns, what is going to happen to the wicked people? What's going to happen? They're going to be gathered together, like we read in, in, in the book of Matthew, and they're going to be like fire, kindling fire. And, 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 and it, it, it's not going to be a good. It's not going to be a good day for people who do not believe, who do not walk in the ways of the Lord, who do not believe on the Son for salvation. It's not going to be a good day. So we need to read those passages too. We need to understand them. And we it should give us hope because right now and in the world that we live in, you know, there. I, I do not watch the news to to find out where we are in, in eschatology, um, but one cannot help but see that there are wars and rumors of wars and there are famines in, in diverse places and earthquakes. I mean, life is hard. And we need to know that, in, last year I, I, I preached on Isaiah 11 and, and it's about the return of that Messiah, uh, that, that, that son of David, that conquering king. And, and one day, even children are going to be able to play with serpents and animals aren't going to try to eat each other anymore and it's going to be what it was when God created it. One day we are going to have peace on earth. One day. But we should read these scriptures. We should know what they say. We should find hope even in an imprecatory song. Um, Charles Spurgeon. Has anybody heard of Spurgeon? That guy is amazing. He had like a photographic memory. And I've been studying some of the things that he wrote and trying to try to figure out how the guy was thinking because I, I really like what he does. I like how he, he, he was a fantastic orator. He, he could get up here and, and preach a sermon and start to finish. He could keep, keep his place. I sometimes lose my place in a sermon. You know, I, I get all caught up in the moment and sometimes I forget where I'm at. And, and he, he was really good at keeping on track on that. Uh, I'm learning. And so he, he said that the Psalms is, uh, is wise, this Psalm 138 is wisely placed. And he said, whoever edited and arranged these uh, sacred poems, he had an eye to opposition and contrast. For if Psalm 137, we, we see the need for silence before revilers. Here we see an, ex, an excellent brave confession, this confession that we're about ready to read from David. 
And that there is a time to be silent, lest we cast pearls before the swine. And there is a time to speak openly, lest we be found guilty of cowardly non-confession. There is a time to be quiet, and there's a time to open your mouth in righteous indignation, but to speak the truth with love. Right? How, how else are we going to give hope to people who have no hope? If we continue to lie to them and tell them it's going to be okay, you can live your life any old way. Jesus loves you. He does, but he wants you to come into right relationship, into understanding who he is. He is the king of kings. Yes, he came first as the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. But when he comes back again, he's coming as a conquering king. All right, <laughs> let's get into this psalm. <laughs> All right, Psalm, psalm 138. And I'm um, gonna, yeah, it kind of divides it up the way I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk through this, preach through this psalm. It starts off, I, okay, let me, let me just back up one second. So, Hebrew poetry, they use parallelisms. They say things several different ways. So it, it, it's kind of a way to forcefully communicate an idea. A forcefully communicate some ideas. And so when he says something, he says it differently three times here. He's trying to forcefully push forward the idea that he has deep in his heart of praise. And his, this idea that he is thankful to God for all that he's been through and that he has, he has fulfilled his promises to him. So, opening up, we're going to see a series of I, I, I. It starts off, I will give thanks with all my heart. I will sing praises to you before the gods. And I will bow down towards your holy temple. When I read that first part, and I know we've taught on this before, um, Pastor Michael has mentioned it, but when a new king entered, he took, he took reign, the first thing he was supposed to do is to write a copy of the Torah for himself to study. And so when I hear this, this, this phrase from, from David, when he says, I will give thanks with all of my heart, what I hear in my, in my mind after studying the scriptures is the Shema. We hear it over and over in the New Testament. They, the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were trying to trip the Lord up, and they said, good teacher, what, what's the greatest commandment? And what did our Lord say? It came from Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all of your might. Isn't that what David is saying? With this open declaration of faith I will give thanks to you with all of my heart not with half of it sometimes we divide ourselves up and we only give the Lord a part of our heart we're not willing to go the whole way and live our life for God sometimes we're afraid to open our mouths and, and declare the goodness of our gods because of the community that we live in or the place, wherever we're at, or if we're at work, we're afraid to, to share the gospel with the people around us. How awesome would it be if every believer was willing to say, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with all of my heart, and not be afraid of who was listening or who, who might be thinking something, wow, this guy's strange. What's he getting so you know, excited about? Wouldn't it be great if the people of God would not be afraid to declare this in the streets today? They're trying to shut our mouths. They're trying to tell us, this is what you have to think about God's creation. You can't use these pronouns or those pronouns. I was born that way. Oh, don't get me started with that, but as a dad who has seven children, Six of them daughters, one of them son. I was waiting for that son many years. And a couple of my daughters are, are tough, like, like guys. 
but there's no mistaking that they're women of God. They're beautiful, and they were created for a purpose just like a man was created for a purpose, and we should live in those purposes. We should find solace in the Word of God, and we should be able to say, I will praise you with all of my heart, Lord. I will sing praises before the gods. What does that mean? Before the gods? A little bit of exegesis on this passage I, I was reading from the, the Greek Septuagint. And the, the word translated for gods <clears throat> is angels. So maybe it paints a picture of David seeing himself amongst the angels of God in this heavenly atmosphere, singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Maybe, maybe that's what we're seeing. Or maybe, maybe it's, it's like I've been talking about earlier. David is, was not ashamed of, of, of professing faith amongst the people that he lived around. All of the heathen nations that were just out to kill every last one of them. Maybe he was saying, I am not, I'm going to declare, I'm going to, I'm going to sing the praises of my God even before the nations and their gods. Most of the people from the nations, they believed in all of these different deities. They had no idea what it was expected of them. They didn't, I mean, they had law codes very similar to the law codes that we find in the Torah. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to drink Thank you. <clears throat> anyway. <clears throat> there it goes. <laughs> Fleeting thought. So, praising God in the presence of people who hate you and hate your God. It takes guts to do that. We should not be ashamed of the gospel. Right? I mean, I know this is like a great big prep talk, pep talk to the people of God in this congregation. Pastor Michael does a really good job of preaching line by line, precept upon precept, and giving hope to this congregation. And, and in a lot of places, we, you, you go and you hear a message, and it's, it's like this uh, theme, right? And, and, and don't get me wrong, some of those things are great. But when you preach line by line through a passage, you, you learn what God is trying to say. We don't have to cherry pick. If you're looking for a precept, preach through a book. You'll find it there. You'll find it there. And that's one of the things I love about Calvary Baptist and the way Michael thinks and teaches. He teaches line by line, precept upon precept, through an entire book. He's not afraid of teaching uh, uh, like the imprecatory psalms. He's not afraid of teaching that. He's not afraid of, of talking about what Paul is saying in Romans 7 about the law of God being spiritual. But our flesh, in our flesh, we can't, we can't do it in, in our flesh. We have to be born from above. We have to be spiritually minded. We have to be followers of Jesus. And we have to be unashamed of declaring His glory to the nations. Unashamed. And as it talks, it says here, the third I will. It says, I will bow down towards your holy temple. Your holy temple. Question. Was there a temple during David's time? He was, given, he was given the blueprint for it, but he hadn't made it yet. So this is one place that people like to take the people of God and say, so you see, this is some kind of redaction and, and add it into the scriptures because it's talking of the temple. But what is the tent of meeting, the Mishkan, they call it in the Hebrew? Is that not the dwelling place of God? Is he not speaking of bowing down in the presence of God? When you speak of a temple, you're speaking of being in the presence of a God. The God, not the gods of the nations. He is going to bow down towards the holy town. And so it's, it's no reason to think that uh, this is some kind of redaction or add addition to the word of God. There are other places in the Psalms where it, it's synonymous with temple, of mishkan, tent of meeting. I will worship towards your holy temple. Even when David was not at the temple, he recognized it was God's appointed place. God's appointed place. Are we not the temples of the living God today? 
our temple was destroyed, right? The you know, Israel was destroyed. Not one stone was left unturned. And Paul was trying to bring meaning to something he was teaching. And he says, don't have any association with, with these people that worship other gods. Because you are the living temple of God. We are to have no association with those things. So when we, when we get before God and we say, I will give thanks with all my heart. I will praise you before the gods and I will bow down towards your holy temple. We can still do that today. We can still treat our bodies as a holy temple of God where the Holy Spirit dwells. We need to be in the presence of God. We can't survive planet Earth. I mean, none of us get off of this planet alive. But if we don't have the Spirit of God in our lives, we are missing an entire aspect of our faith that gets largely swept under the rug. All too often we want to read and understand and have this head, head knowledge, but are, are we willing to step in the presence of God and be actually hear the Holy Spirit speak to you and say, uh, uh, give you a divine appointment with your neighbor, if, if you will, or with somebody that you come in contact with that you never have spoken to before? You're, 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 you're doing life, right? And, and you're in a shopping center, and you're buying stuff, and you see somebody, and, and something inside of you says, go tell them the good news. Without the Holy Spirit of God, are you going to hear that voice? Are you just going to, I read, I read the word, i I, I got to hide it in my heart. That's true, so that we don't sin against God. Your word have I hidden in my heart, O oh Lord, that I might not sin against you? But if we aren't sharing this, then we are not following the Great Commission. Matthew 28, right? Go into all the nations. You can't do that without the Holy Spirit in your life. You can't have the Holy Spirit in your life if you don't have this relationship with God, if you don't believe in the Son, and if you're not studying your Word, because you're not going to know Him. Because that's how we understand who God is today. We read His Word. We hide it in our hearts. And then we share it with people we love, with people we don't know, and we do. We are doing this wrong if we're not sharing this. People are perishing without hope. I can't, I can't go to sleep at night without having said something to somebody. I can't. It should be like a fire shut up in your bones. You can't, you can't move without thinking about sharing this word with somebody. I mean, that, that's the whole reason I went to school. I mean, I, I, was a, a, I was a chaplain at Rock Reach Out Jail Ministries, and not a lot of people know who I was before... Um, before I got into ministry, but I was a thug. I was a, a gangster disciple. I was somebody who, who beat people up. I was somebody who did all kinds of crazy things. And then one day I had had my had my uh, encounter with, with the living Lord of, of Lords and the God of creation. I had an encounter with him that I couldn't deny. And I said, I believe you, Lord. And of all places, it was in the Assembly of God's churches. Not, not that that's a bad place, but they were. it was a movie called Left Behind. And we kind of joke about it, you know, the pre-tribulation rapture, people driving down the road, and then all of a sudden there's just clothes there, and airplanes crashing, and, and it, it did something to me. It was like, wake up, Lou. Your life is wrong. You're living for all the wrong things. You're doing all the wrong things. Your family is a family of faith. What are you doing? My mom prayed for me all the time. Oh my goodness, if it wasn't for the prayers of my family, I don't know where I would have been. To, I, I didn't know where I would be today. Seven out of ten of my friends either wound up in prison or shot dead. Walking out of an apartment building, being sawed in half with a shotgun. He had children. Sitting in a car, his cousin was trying to kill somebody else in the car and shot his own cousin in the face, one of my best friends. Seven kids he had at the age of 17. He had more kids than I did. It was amazing. And the guy could sing. And back then it was like rap. So he could beatbox. He could make noises with his voice. You, know, you ever seen that, uh, that movie, um, Police Academy, and that, 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 that fellow that can make noises? My friend was just like that. He could make all kinds of funny noises. And people would look at him and, did you really make that noise? He was really good at it, but gone. Gone. Wrong place, wrong time. 
If it hadn't been for God in my life, I would have been right next to him in a grave. People would be coming to, to, to see my grave and wonder what I would have amounted to had I only lived long enough to do so. The last couple of months, I had to bury one of my best friend's sons. I had to, sit, I had to, had to give the sermon for him. People lose hope when they don't know God's word. They don't know his promises. They don't know what God is willing to do in their lives if they would only take the time to do it. Read the word. Because you never know. You're going to be in a situation and that passage of scripture that you read, that declaration that David was making, you're never going to know when that passage of scripture pops up in your heart and gives you hope for that day or gives you something to say to your friend whose son is, is now in the ground and he had just had a child. You, you never know. It gave hope to my friend. And my friend knew me back when I was in gangs and doing all kinds of stupid stuff. And, and man, I dabbled in the occult. I did all kinds of things. God pulled me from the fire, literally. If I had died in that state, I would not have gone to be with him. I would have been in everlasting torment with all of the other unbelievers who failed to heed the word of God, when that small voice that, that you have as a conscience, the Holy Spirit tells you. But there's a time where your voice, the Holy Spirit, you're, you're, you're seared. You don't hear that voice anymore. And then it becomes okay for you to do anything you want, to say anything you want, and to teach other people to do those wicked things too, and feel justified in doing it, because you've been basically cut off from the source. That's why we need to continue to be in the Word. We need to continue to bring praises amongst the God inhabits praises of His people. You want to get in the presence of the Lord God? Get in His Word and praise Him every day, like, like David does. And then, like I said here, I'm getting back. Um, I'm in um, 138, uh, 2B two, two through 3. So it's the second part of 128, 2. It says, and I will give thanks to your name for your loving kindness and for your truth. Three things. So we just saw the three things that he was praising. I will, I will, I will. And now we have three more things. For your name. He's giving thanks for his name, for his loving kindness, and for his truth. What is his truth, people? His truth is the word of God, is it not? He was thanking God for that word that was given to him, that word that he wrote down as he was taking rulership over the nation of Israel, that word that guided and directed him so that he was a righteous king, so that he walked in the ways of God, so that he would have victory in, in the presence of his enemies. Is that not what it says in Psalm 23? He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil. It's talking of, of his, he was being chosen as the people of God, as the king and, and the leader. God chose him. In, in um, Acts 13, sorry, I was taking notes just before because I had to. Acts 13, go to Acts 13, chapter, or verse 22, Acts 13, 22, sorry. David to be their king concerning whom he also testified and said I have found David the son of Jesse a man after my own heart who will do all my will so anybody that knows David has read anything about David they know that he was the youngest son of Jesse he wasn't very well liked by his brothers. He was probably made fun of because he wasn't probably as big and tough as they were maybe because they were all on the battlefield with that 
you know, at Philistine that thought he was going to speak against God and against the people of God. And, and this young, young man shows up with a sling and five smooth stones and kills that giant. He, he gets righteously... He started off strong, didn't he, right? I mean, he was righteous for God and, 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 and the praise. He had zeal. But what happened with, with Uriah, with Bathsheba? He fell in temptation, gave into the lusts of the flesh, and took his friend's wife and sent him to the front lines. So he committed adultery and he murdered his friend. How on earth is this man a king, a person after God's own heart? How? He was repentant. He loved God. He wanted to do the will of God. But like everyone in this room, we, we sometimes stumble, we fumble, we regroup. Paul says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Thank God for the grace of God that, that saves us all. It also echoes in, in 1 Samuel 13, 14 through 15. When Saul defeated the nations, God told him, don't take anything from amongst them. Nothing. Nothing. But Saul's flesh overcame him. He took the best of everything there and thought, oh, I'm just going to bring an offering to the Lord. It's going to be okay. He requires obedience, not sacrifice. Isn't that what he said? Obedience to his word. God will destroy all of your enemies if you just obey him and you walk in his ways. We don't need to be big and strong. We don't need to be mighty. We just need to know the mighty God because he will destroy the wicked someday. Okay. All right. Can you uh, move the slide up one more? Oh. Sorry, I missed part of this here. It says here in uh, 3, it says, For you have magnified your word according to all your name. Another way of saying that would be, For your promises are backed by all honor of the name of your name. So, when in Hebrews 6 and 13, the name of God, it's, it's it's his character, right? His promises are eternal. They're everlasting. They, they can't be taken back. Hebrews 6 and 13. All right. It says here, For when God made the, uh, the promise to Abraham, since he could swear an oath by no greater he swore by himself, saying, Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply you. And so, having uh, patiently waited, he obtained the promise for the people. For people swear an oath by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath, serving as a confirmation, is an end of every dispute. There was no other name. There is no other name by which man can be saved. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord. His promises are forever to the people of God. It says here in Isaiah 42 and 21, it says, The Lord was pleased with his, for his righteous sake to make the law great and glorious. And it says... In Psalm 140, it says, Surely the righteous will give thanks to your name. The upright will dwell in your presence. Praise be to God. Let's get in his presence today. Okay. It says here, On that day I called, you answered me. You made me bold with strength in my soul. You know, sometimes we don't get an answer right away when we pray. Right? I mean, I pray all the time. Sometimes it just seems like I'm not hearing the answer yet. Sometimes the answer is no, right? 
You know, when you're praying for something fervently and, and you're not omniscient, you, you, you don't know all things, but you, you're asking for something and the answer is no. So sometimes we have to, we have to accept that no. Uh, okay, so it says here, uh, what I wrote down, it says, David also had a very practical reason to praise and thank God. The Lord had answered and rescued him many times. And when David, David's strength failed him, God made him bold with strength. When I read that, I, I, I automatically think about its time. He, he had already been anointed. God had anointed him as the new king. But Saul was not gone yet. And it was this horrible game of hide and seek with Saul because he wanted to kill David so badly. And, and, and David was a righteous man. Several times he could have taken Saul's life, but he was, too, he was also anointed. So his reverence for God, he said, let God deal with, with Saul. He will deal with him. I will not touch God's anointed. He had a reverence for God, even though the man was trying to kill him. Made him bold. I mean, he, he cut out pieces of his garment. Saul didn't even know he was there. It says here, um, we notice an important pattern in, in the reasons why David gave for his praises. It is important to praise God for who he is even more than for what he has done for us. Wow. I just praise you for who you are, Lord. Sometimes when you're going through a storm, and somebody you love is suffering. It happens to me all, all the time. I live, I live this life. I live this life. You just have to give praise for who he is. Not for what you've been given or what you think you have coming. Even if I have nothing but the clothes on my back, let it always be said that I give you praise, oh God. It says here, it says he made me bold. The psalmist uses this remarkable expression in saying that uh, the Lord had made him bold, or as the word is literally proud. Are you proud to be a believer? Or are you ashamed to name the name of Yeshua, Jesus, Yeshua as his Hebrew name? I find so much in that name. The Hebrew, Hebrew names are short sentences. Right? They, they say something. They communicate something. The word Yeshua, when you say that, you're declaring that Yah is salvation. He's my Savior. We don't really know how to pronounce the, the Tetragrammaton, yud heh vav -Hey. Some say Yehovah, some say Jehovah, some say Yahweh. We don't really know. We know that Yah is a short form of that name, so I feel comfortable saying that. It's not like I have a problem with sacred names. I don't. Jesus is sacred. I say it all the time. I just, when I say Yeshua, sometimes I'm slipping up. I say Jesus, Yeshua, interchangeably. I, I, when I say it, I just feel like I'm declaring, you are my Savior. You are my Savior, my only hope. Kind of like um, when um, Princess Leia was talking to R2-D2. Save us, Obi-Wan, you're our only hope. Sorry. There's a moment of love. <laughs> laughter. I've been too heavy all the sermon. Um, okay, so it says here, all the kings of the earth will give thanks to you, O Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth, and when they will sing, the, sing of your ways and the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord, for though the Lord is exalted, yet he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Several things jump out at me. He says, when they have heard the words of your mouth, the kings will give glory. If we have shut our mouths, if we refuse to share the gospel with people we know and we don't know, how will they know that they need to give glory to the King of kings and Lord of lords if we are keeping our mouths shut? Open your mouths, people of God, and share the good news with everyone. When the Lord was coming into Jerusalem before that triumphant victory over, over death, they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Save us, son of David. 
And one of the, the Pharisees and them said, oh, you must stop them. Don't let them say that. What did the Lord say? The rocks would cry out if they don't. Don't let a rock cry out and give praises to the God of creation. He gave you the gift of his word, his Holy Spirit. You study his word daily. Share the gospel with everyone you know. You don't know when that day comes for somebody, when he's going to be called from this world. We don't know. We could be the last person to talk to them. And we didn't share the gospel with them. Why? What are we ashamed of? It says here that the kings of the world, all of these people that are in high places that would probably not even talk to somebody like me, maybe, but someday somebody's going to reach them with the gospel and they are going to give praise to the king of kings. And they will sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is exalted, yet he regards the lowly. Pastor Michael did an incredible book and a teaching on um, the Beatitudes in Matthew. The lowly, they are the poor, but in poor in spirit, those who mourn. Uh, it says, blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Oh, I want to see God. I just, oh, man. And blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. When you open your mouth and you are persecuted for speaking the truth in love and for sharing hope in a world that is dark and destined for destruction and you're persecuted for it, know that you are blessed. And if that's not enough, I don't know what it's going to take to fire us up, church. Don't be ashamed. Even if they persecute us, we have blessings before our God. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. And Jesus said, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same that day, I'm not in front of my Lord. I hope I get that well done, good and faithful son or servant. I hope I get that. I'm striving for that. All he's done for me in my life, he saved me. He brought me out of darkness. He gave me the ability to think. I dropped out of high school when I was 15. I started a family. I was so crazy. I couldn't read very well. I was a slow learner, but here I am now. I'm getting a PhD in biblical exposition. I'm studying Greek and Hebrew. God has helped me through it all. I have much to be appreciative. And I'm not tooting my horn here. I'm just saying, if God can do it for me, he can do it for anyone in this room. Oftentimes I hear people who are much older than myself tell me that they can't do it. They can't learn. It's just not true. You can do it. You can. I, when I was in, I, I was going to school at Rock Valley College, I met a guy that was a, 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 a scientist in physics and he was going back to school so he could learn um, how to do HTML programming and things like that because he wanted to develop a website or something. And, and he was uh, he was like 67 years old. The guy was still sharp as a tack. Not that 67 is too old for anything. I'm just saying, I get, I get it a lot. I'm too old. I can't learn anything new. I'm an old dog. can't learn new tricks. That's just not true. We can do whatever it is that we set our minds to. And if we have it in our heart to learn God's word and to understand it in a deeper fashion, then God will open our hearts. All we have to do is apply ourselves to it. And I've kind of gone a long time ago. What I want to say is make your life a living sacrifice to God. Praise Him while there is still breath left in your in your lungs. Give him the glory. Share the gospel with everyone you come in contact with because you don't know when that last day is for them. Be diligent. 
Don't give up hope. You're not too old to learn. You're not too young to learn. Read your Bibles every day. And may God bless you and keep you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.